A brief overview of the coagulation cascade, thus narrated by Travis Keaton for Dr. Irwin's 9 o'clock biology 1107 class. The process of forming a clot is known as the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade belongs to a family of chemical reactions known as biochemical cascades. Biochemical cascade is a series of chemical reactions where the product of one reaction is consumed in the next reaction in the cascade so as to facilitate the incremental generation of a highly complex organic molecule. The enzymes that take part in the coagulation cascade are known as coagulation factors. The coagulation cascade can be defined as a series of chemical reactions where an inactive enzyme precursor, known as a zymogen, of the serine proteins, as well as any of its glycoprotein factors are activated and then proceed to activate or catalyze the activation of another zymogen of the serine proteins with the end result being the formation of a cardiovascular plug composed of a cross-linked fiber. The majority of these factors belong to a family of proteins called serine proteins. Serine proteins are enzymes with the amino acid serine as their active site that are responsible for cleaving peptide bonds in certain proteins. This amino acid is coded by the codons UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG, AGU, and AGC. The coagulation cascade can be separated into three pathways. The intrinsic pathway, also known as the contact pathway. The extrinsic pathway, also known as the tissue factor pathway. And the common pathway. When initiated, the coagulation cascade will begin by following either the intrinsic or extrinsic pathway. Both of these pathways will eventually meet and thus begin the common pathway. Hence the name, common pathway. The extrinsic pathway is also referred to as a tissue factor pathway because of how it begins when cardiovascular vessels experience some sort of trauma. The thin layer of cells that line in the interior walls of the blood and lymphatic vessels, known as endothelium cells, release thromboplastin tissue factor, frequently referred to as coagulation factor 3 or simply F3. They also re release proconvertin, also called coagulation factor 7 or simply F7. F3 and 7 then bind with, and therefore activate, prothaminase, which is also known as coagulation factor 10. The activation of factor 10 marks the transition from the extrinsic pathway to the common pathway. However, before we look at the common pathway, we will first explore the intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway, much like the extrinsic pathway, is initiated by tissue factor, but incorporates a component of the blood known as platelets. Platelets are components of blood that help facilitate the clotting of blood and the subsequent repair of, da of damaged blood vessels. When cardiovascular vessels walls breached, such as when cut, the blood seeps out of the vessel and into the surrounding tissue. This does two things. First, it causes the blood to come in contact with the exterior of the blood vessel wall, which is covered in tiny F3 tissue factors particles. Secondly, it allows collagen which is located inside the vessel walls to come in contact and bind with platelets which are scattered throughout the blood. This will activate the platelets, causing them to release the coagulation factor known as prothrombin. But now, prothrombin causes more platelets to breach where they bind other platelets. But it plays a much more important role, which we will discuss later on. As it stands, this process is too slow and the platelets themselves not strong enough to form a stable clot. But, factor 7, which floats freely in the blood, is able to come in contact with the F3 tissue factor, which is on the outside of the blood vessel walls. It is activated upon contact, and the activated F7 is then able to bind the plasma thromboplastin antecedent, or simply factor 11, which in turn will bind the coagulation factor 9. The activated factor 9 will then activate prothrombinase, also known as the Stuart Prower factor or just factor 10. The activation of factor 10 is slightly different from the activation of other coagulation factors in the intrinsic pathway. Factor 10 has three cofactors that aid and accelerate its activation. These factors are antihemophilic factor or simply factor 8, simple calcium ions, and of course the platelets themselves. The activation of factor 10 marks the end of the intrinsic pathway and the beginning of the common pathway. However, before continuing on to the common pathway, it should be noted that the extrinsic and intrinsic pathways are not mutually exclusive. 
rather they commonly occur in tandem. Breaching a blood vessel, thus initiating the intrinsic pathway, is almost guaranteed to cause trauma to cells in the immediate vicinity of the breach, thus activating the intrinsic pathway. Though trauma can occur to blood vessels without causing a breach, in which case only the extrinsic pathway is initiated. As such, the extrinsic pathway is more common of the two. Now back to the common pathway. The common pathway begins with factor 10, which is produced at the end of both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, activates prothrombin, which is a coagulation factor released by platelets, with the help of three cofactors, coagulation factor 5, calcium ions, and of course the platelet. When activated, prothrombin becomes the all-important factor 2, also known as thrombin. The thrombin activates fibrinogen, converting it into the all-important fibrin molecule, which then binds to coagulation factor 13 and calcium to form cross-linked fibrin, which binds with the platelets and endothelial cells, thus creating a sort of net, which then catches red blood cells and other fibrin strands, thus forming a stable blood clot. However, left alone, this is too slow of a process. But thrombin doesn't just activate fibrinogen. It also catalyzes the activation of several other factors which are needed for the activation of prothrombin, and thus the production of thrombin. Factors 8, 5, 11, and 13 are all catalyzed by thrombin, which results in more thrombin, and therefore more fibrin, and therefore a stronger clot. This gives the coagulation cascade its cascade effect. The cascade is so effective that it can be dangerous. If a clot becomes so large that it restricts blood flow, it results in what's known as thrombosis, which can cut off circulation, or in worst cases even break off into the blood, cause a heart attack, and kill you. To prevent the cascade from getting out of hand, the body possesses several anticoagulants. Anticoagulants are those proteins that prevent the formation of a clot by inhibiting coagulation factors once concentrations of thrombin reach a certain level. The body will begin to produce antithrombin, thrombodulin, and tissue factor pathway inhibitor, or simply TFPI. Thrombomodulin, with the help from a protein S, activates anticoagulant called unactivated protein C, which when activated, becomes activated protein C, which inhibits the activations of factor 8 and 5. Antithrombin is a small 432 amino acid long protein chain that is responsible for inhibiting factor 5 and thrombin. TFPI, as its name suggests, inhibits tissue factor from forming by binding with tissue factor itself, thus preventing it from binding with any other factors, and thus stops the formation of a clot when the appropriate clot size has been reached. 